One bullet. One gunman. One official conclusion that 75% of Americans say they don't believe. The idea that a, a person could take this piece of junk and hit a moving target is ludicrous. Was Oswald a solitary assassin or a well-played patsy? I positively know nothing about this situation here. New evidence of not just one assassination attempt, but three. The Kennedy assassination remains, over four decades later, one of the great untold stories. Tantalizing clues about a mafia hit, a government cover-up. We have smoking gun documents from the CIA. And a presidential scheme that allowed it to happen. After examining everything from the site of the shooting to the gun itself, the Warren Commission, charged with investigating the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, finds that he was brutally gunned down by Lee Harvey Oswald, a disgruntled ex-Marine with Soviet ties and Cuban sympathies. He acted alone. Today, most libraries had dumped their uh, volumes of the Warren Commission, and for most people, they realize it needs to go on the fiction show. Now, authors Lamar Waldron and Tom Hartman lay out in their book, Ultimate Sacrifice, what they believe is the real story behind the Kennedy assassination. It's a new twist on an old theory. The mafia did it. But the authors insist it was the mob's knowledge of a secret plan by the Kennedys to overthrow Castro that gave the mafia the perfect cover. They were able to assassinate JFK in a way that forced Bobby Kennedy and other key government officials to cover up much crucial information to protect that top secret coup plan. It's a theory that's captured the attention of other JFK assassination researchers. Though they don't all agree with the conclusion, they recognize it's a well-researched scenario. Waldron and Hartman have spent two decades pouring through thousands of government documents and interviewing key players with revelations to tell. This is their proof. November 22nd, 1963. President Kennedy died at approximately one o'clock Central Standard Time, which is about 35 minutes ago. As a country reels in shock and disbelief, a thousand miles away from Dallas, at a restaurant in Tampa, a celebration is underway. Mobster Santo Traficante raises his glass and toasts the assassination of John F. Kennedy. For Mafia Don Carlos Marcello in New Orleans, and for Johnny Rosselli in Chicago, it is also welcome news. The president's death marks the end of Bobby Kennedy's crusade against them, a relentless campaign that resulted in 12 times more cases brought against organized crime than ever before. As Carlos Marcello explained it, if you cut off the tail of the dog, kill Bobby Kennedy, the head of the dog, JFK, will turn around and bite you. However, if you cut off the head of the dog, you kill JFK, the tail of the dog stops wagging on its own. Whispers of a mafia hit on the president begin to circulate almost immediately. The mob's hatred of the Kennedy family is no secret. Uh, the, we have uh, organized crime and some uh, big gangsters and hoodlums. The strongest motive for murder is self-defense. And in the case of the mafia, I'm sure they viewed this as self-defense. After JFK was buried, Bobby was literally a shattered man, a shell of what he had been. All the mafia prosecutions were scaled back. It's a dangerous game Bobby's been playing going after powerful gangsters while his family has its own tangled relationship with them. From his father's bootlegging days to JFK's relationship with a godfather's girlfriend. But it's another connection to the mob that would bring down the president. There was a deal to use the mafia to uh, get rid of Castro. For years, the CIA had enlisted the mafia's help to overthrow Castro. Can you uh, refresh your recollection at all? The Kennedy administration's on, crusade uh, against the mob back home is a slap in the face, a betrayal. By, uh, it's the final straw. 
In the summer of 1963, those twisted links among Cuba, the CIA, and the mob become the foundations of a plot to kill Kennedy. But an unwitting decision by the Kennedys themselves is the catalyst. After countless failed attempts by the CIA to remove or kill Castro, like the disastrous Bay of Pigs invasion, the Kennedy brothers come up with their own plan to eliminate Castro once and for all. JFK was faced with a quandary of how could he uh, deal with this Cuban situation uh, before the 64 campaign really kicked off early in 1964. Few administration officials ever learn of the plan. Among them, Secretary of State Dean Rusk. We were quite surprised when he told us that John and Robert Kennedy uh, were getting ready to stage a coup against Fidel Castro. But it's a CIA memo dated June 28, 1963, that lays out the covert operation in black and white. Code name, AM World. Kubark is code for the CIA. P. Bruman, Cuba, and Odiok, the Kennedys. They echo the wording of Mission Impossible, the old TV show from the 60s, where the government says these, these groups have to be based outside the continental United States, but that if the United States is ever charged with complicity, uh, the United States will publicly deny any knowledge of, of these folks' operations. This once top secret CIA document reveals the date of the scheduled coup. December 1st, 1963. It's only months away. Bobby Kennedy takes great pains to keep the president from being directly connected to AM World. Bobby himself meets with Cuban exile leaders to plan the overthrow. This was something that was being very tightly controlled by Bobby. He was trying to run it in a, in, in the, in a way that it wouldn't become an open secret like the Bay of Pigs had. There's little doubt that Bobby's running the show. But what Bobby doesn't realize is that AM World isn't the only show in town. Even as the CIA assigns operatives to the Kennedy's coup plan, unknown to the brothers, the agency is still secretly working with the mafia to kill Castro. And these plots, of course, range from the sublime to the ridiculous, like exploding cigars and depilatories and everything else. But then there were also some serious consideration given to assassination attempts, etc., etc. It's a mutually satisfying arrangement for both. The mob has much desired connections to the Cuban underworld, while the CIA turns a blind eye to the mafia's profitable gambling, arms sales, and drug rings there. The CIA mafia plots we now know existed to assassinate Fidel Castro were carried out without the knowledge or without the approval of President Kennedy. Directing the mob contingent, none other than Santo Traficante, Johnny Rosselli, and Carlos Marcello. It's only a matter of time before they get wind of the Kennedy coup plan through their CIA contacts. By July 1963, six mob associates infiltrate the plan. The CIA has no idea that their mafia collaborators are now players in the president's covert operation. Waldron and Hartman believe they have uncovered the evidence to prove this chain of events really happened. We even have smoking gun documents from the CIA that clearly show where a key Cuban exile leader, in this case, Tony Verona, was paid $200,000 by Roselli's Chicago Mafia in the summer of 1963. But the Mafia realizes it's in prime position for something no one dared consider before. Under the protection of the CIA, in the shadows of a secret coup plan, a presidential assassination plot is born. It appears as though something has happened in the motorcade group. Parkland Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot burst. When someone succeeds at something as glorious in their mind as killing the president of the United States, they want to let the world know that, uh, that they did it. Uh, I don't know what this is all about. Lee Harvey Oswald never did. I'm just a patsy. That odd statement by Oswald, I'm just a patsy, would become the springboard for numerous conspiracy theories surrounding the assassination of President Kennedy. 
Was Oswald just a fall guy? A small cog in a much larger operation? Researchers Lamar Waldron and Tom Hartman believe their new evidence of a mafia plot paints a far more sinister picture of events leading up to the assassination. Are you going to have anything to say, Mr. Genevieve? Are you going to cooperate with the commission? In 1963, Bobby Kennedy's crusade against organized crime is about to provoke a retaliation he never envisioned. Oh, you won't tell us anything about using the acid to uh, disfigure a person, <coughs> ordering someone to uh, kill a man. Bobby crosses the line when he sets his sights on top mob boss Carlos Marcello of New Orleans. Marcello was, by all accounts, the chief of chiefs, the godfather among godfathers. And uh, he often said uh, that if three people know a secret and two of them are dead, there's no problem. After being subjected to Senate hearings, FBI surveillance, even a deportation to Guatemala, Marcelo sneaks back into the U.S., hell-bent on getting rid of Bobby Kennedy. Mob boss Santo Traficante of Tampa is also in the crosshairs of Bobby Kennedy's crusade. For years, he's been hiding in his other mafia kingdom, Cuba. Havana was the number one source of mafia funds before the Castro regime took power and threw the mafia out of the gambling casinos in Havana. It made Las Vegas look like a uh, chump change. Of certain fringe benefits. With the in heat the on back in the States and desperate for a return to the glory days in Havana, the mafia chiefs are more than willing when the CIA comes to them for help with those ongoing attempts to oust Castro. And now that the mobsters know about the secret Kennedy coup plan, AM World, they have the cover they need to kill the president with virtual impunity. It would be impossible to thoroughly or publicly investigate JFK's assassination without exposing the plan for a coup in Cuba. If Castro ever got wind of the coup plan, it could lead to another confrontation with the United States, like the Bay of Pigs fiasco and the Cuban Missile Crisis that nearly led to nuclear war. Any assassination attempt by the mob would have to be made before December 1st, the date set for the Kennedy's coup. The perfect scenario. A public place, a tall structure, and an open motorcade. In November 1963, the opportunity presents itself. Not once, but three times. Not only was there a likely conspiracy in Dallas to kill the president, but earlier in Tampa, Florida, and even before that in Chicago. Mafia sharpshooters would take out the president, but the mob needs someone else to take the fall. The reason that these three godfathers wanted to have a patsy involved in each one of the three attempts against John Kennedy in those, that roughly two and a half week period there, um, was that they wanted instantly for uh, the attention or for the suspicion to be diverted away from them and toward Cuba. Through their CIA and law enforcement connections, the mob learns about the men in each city most likely to arouse government suspicion, even be arrested after the president is killed. In Dallas, there's no better fall guy than Lee Harvey Oswald. In Tampa, another pro Castro supporter, Gilberto Lopez. And in Chicago, a gun-loving ex-Marine, Thomas Arthur Valley. There was also a Cuba connection. In Valley's background, he had recently been training anti-Castro Cubans. But only three days before the president's visit to Chicago, the mob loses its patsy there. Valley is caught during a traffic stop with a trunkload of rifles and ammunition. He's arrested, questioned, but never charged. The same day, there's another fatal blow to the mob's Chicago plan. Someone tips off the FBI that a team of hitmen is there trying to assassinate the president. There were supposed to have been four men in, in this particular uh, conspiracy. Secret Service agent Abraham Bolden is on detail in Chicago when the FBI contacts the field office there about the plan to kill the president. What happens next shocks Bolden. We were told no paper trail, that, that all of the files, notebooks, anything pertaining to that particular case had to be turned into the special agent in charge. And we were told 
That case never existed. Kennedy's trip to Chicago is called off at the last minute. The official reason? The president needs to deal with a situation in Vietnam. This uh, cancellation was so sudden, uh, people were already starting to line up along the motorcade route, but the Kennedys were able to keep a lid on uh, this threat, and so it didn't reach the press at that time. The assassination threat is never made public. Agent Bolden later tries to contact the Warren Commission on his own. He knows his superiors will be furious. I think the Secret Service wanted to give one story, and they didn't want to get, have any conflict by what that they were officially telling the Warren Commission. But days before he's to testify, Bolden is arrested. He's later convicted for bribery and solicitation on an unrelated counterfeit case. He spends three years in jail. We've gathered a fairly abundant uh, collection of evidence that Bolden was framed. And you know, here's a guy who was really one of the people doing a, a great and noble job and thought he had information that was really going to help. And, and for this, you know, his life is destroyed. Why isn't there any mention of this Chicago assassination attempt in the Warren Commission report? It does show how secret those attempts were and that the secrecy surrounding those attempts were uh, linked to national security concerns related to the coup plan. Although the Mafia chiefs are frustrated that their first attempt is foiled, the hasty cover-up of the threat gives them confidence to move forward with another assassination attempt only a few weeks later. An assassination attempt in Chicago only weeks before Dallas. How could the Warren Commission overlook the evidence? Authors Lamar Waldron and Tom Hartman believe there was a high-level effort to keep the Commission from knowing too much about the assassination of President Kennedy. And the mob knew that. The well-intentioned. Avoid World War III, avoid the end of all life on Earth, cover-up plan would go into place. Only days after the Mafia aborts its plan to shoot the president in Chicago, high-level members of Kennedy's administration are scrambling. But it's not the mob they're worried about. It's Castro. Castro was quoted shortly before the Kennedy assassination as saying, I know your people are trying to get me, and you better get the word out that if something happens to me, something's going to happen to your person. The administration worries there will be more attempts to kill the president, but its focus is on Cuba and not on the mob. The trip to Tampa is too important to cancel. JFK was set to give a speech, a major speech on Cuba that would be widely reported, not just in the United States press. In several lines of that speech, uh, the CIA says they wrote for JFK to give. It is a message to the coup leader that Kennedy will publicly support the new regime after Castro. But shortly before Kennedy is to arrive in Tampa, the mob's second assassination attempt begins to unravel when rumors about the hit begin to circulate. Law enforcement confirms the plot, but with the president determined to go on with the trip, it's little consolation. They were very concerned about a tall building, the Floridian Hotel, the tallest building in Tampa, that overlooked a hard left turn along the motorcade route. In fact, it looks very much like the School Book Depository, only much taller, with many more unguarded windows. On November 18th, the motorcade proceeds as planned. At one point, the president actually stands up in the open car. This wasn't reckless defiance. This was Jack Kennedy cueing a potential ally in Cuba that, you know, we are with you. I'm willing to take these kinds of risks for you. This is the kind of sacrifice I'm willing to make. Everyone is on edge. Kennedy, police, Secret Service. What they don't know is that Mafia Chief Santo Traficante has learned of the leak from his police mole. The assassination attempt in Tampa is called off before Kennedy even gets in the car. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. The rest of the President's trip goes as scheduled, much to the relief of the Kennedys, 
and to the frustration of the mob. There is only one chance left to kill the president before the coup plan goes into action. Dallas. The day of the president's arrival, Mafia chief Johnny Rosselli suddenly disappears from FBI surveillance. Four unconfirmed reports from mob informants place Rosselli in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. I don't think he was going to grab a gun and, and run out the street and shoot Kennedy if it, if it didn't work, but he was going to make sure nobody screwed anything up. And there's someone else in Dallas, a nightclub owner with a much greater role in the assassination than the government ever lets on. Jack Ruby had been a, a low-level gangster figure in, in drugs and prostitution and, and other unsavory areas for, for many decades. Suddenly, Ruby gets a mysterious down payment of $7,000 and starts talking about a move to the richest part of town. He was paid off by associates of Jimmy Hoffa, the corrupt uh, teamster boss who was himself deeply connected to the mafia just weeks before Dallas. So that again uh, raises all sorts of questions about why Ruby was receiving this payment so close to the assassination. How could this lowly mob soldier become key to the plot to kill the president? Ruby is the mob's insider at the Dallas Police Department, a man with long-standing friendships with many officers in the force. But he's more than the mob's eyes and ears. If Oswald is arrested for the assassination, it's Ruby's job to take him out. The theory is that because he was able to slip in and out of the police department at will, he'd be a good guy to hire to kill Oswald. No one else but Ruby could possibly get close enough to kill Oswald after he's taken into custody. I positively know nothing about this situation here. On the morning of November 22nd, Thousands line the presidential motorcade route in Dallas. The president rides with the first lady and Texas Governor John Connolly and his wife. There was not an active threat in Dallas. The Secret Service thought they could breathe a sigh of relief, as did JFK. So people had to some degree let their guard down in Dallas. The motorcade begins at noon. By 12.30, the line of limos approaches the intersection of Houston and Elm Streets in downtown Dallas, Dealey Plaza. It's a hard turn onto Elm. The cars slow to a virtual crawl. Suddenly, a burst of gunfire scatters pigeons and sends onlookers ducking for cover. In less than six seconds, a president is fatally gunned down. The number of shots and the direction that they came from will be hotly debated for the next 40 years. Lee Harvey Oswald's rifle. This is an exact duplicate. The idea that a, a person who can only qualify by two points at the lowest rung of the military's weapons proficiency test could take this piece of junk and hit a moving target and find his sight picture in 5.6 seconds is ludicrous. Were you in the building at the time? Naturally, if I work in that building, yes, sir. Back up, man. There is no doubt Lee Harvey Oswald is in the Texas School Book Depository overlooking Dealey Plaza that day. And the rifle used to kill the president belongs to Oswald. But does he fire the weapon? Or is Oswald set up to take the fall? The Warren Commission's case against Lee Harvey Oswald seems open and shut. I positively know nothing about this A disgruntled ex-Marine who had defected to the Soviet Union and is vocal in his support of Castro. On November 22nd, he's working at the Texas School Book Depository, a building with a perfect view of the presidential motorcade. Oswald's own rifle, found stashed on the sixth floor, delivers the fatal shots. Either Oswald did the shooting, or the shooting was done by someone else using Oswald's gun. That's really what it comes down to. But why didn't Oswald attempt to escape immediately? Instead, he hangs around the building for a while, later telling authorities he was in the lunchroom downstairs when the president is shot. 
A Dallas policeman who rushes to the building less than two minutes after the shooting reports seeing Oswald on the floor where the lunchroom is located. So Oswald would have had to fire those fatal shots, race to the opposite end of the sixth floor where the rifle was stashed, come back to where the door was, go down six flights of stairs, and then be standing there calm, feeling and collected when the policeman showed up. Many eyewitnesses tell police that they heard other shots from the front of the president's motorcade, the infamous grassy knoll of Dealey Plaza. The Warren Commission dismisses these accounts in its 1964 report, determining that Oswald fires alone from the book depository. But even two of Kennedy's top aides, riding in the limo directly behind the president's, insist that there was more than one shooter. Both of these men were World War II veterans, so they knew the sound of gunfire, and they were convinced that the shots, including the fatal shot that uh, took away part of the president's head, were fired from the front. Dave Powers, one of those White House aides, in a startling admission to researcher Tom Hartman shortly before he dies, describes being pressured to change his testimony to investigators. I asked him, you know, why didn't you tell the Warren Commission this? And uh, he said, I tried to, I would have liked to. Uh, I kept getting interrupted whenever I got to that. So many omissions that make the Warren Commission's declaration that Oswald acted alone so hard to believe. But is the complex and sinister plot, detailed by Hartman and Waldron, the truth about what happened that terrible day in Dallas? It surely adds dots to the picture that we have of what happened. It's not the dots that are troubling to other assassination investigators. It's the connections between them. To believe that the mob could infiltrate the Kennedy's secret plan to oust Castro, you must first believe such a plan was actually going to happen. The Kennedys had no imminent plan to invade Cuba. Of course, there were always contingency plans. The Kennedys were constantly looking at various scenarios. There is no doubt Castro was a thorn in Kennedy's side. The 1963 coup plan could simply be one possible scenario to resolve the Cuba issue. But I believe that uh, these authors, Mr. Uh, Waldron and Hartman, have confused what were contingency plans for the real deal. But if AM World was simply a contingency plan, why would this once secret document mention a general uprising scheduled for December 1st? That's the clock that runs the assassination timeline. The mobsters knew they had to get Kennedy before the coup, or their leverage would be gone. The idea that this was going to culminate in Decem on December 1, 1963, it's based on a reading of a single document where somebody says, we're going to do something soon, and attaches a date to it. There's no other basis for saying that something big was going to happen on that date. And there's lots of evidence that it wasn't going to happen. But not all evidence needs to be in black and white to suggest the plan was in motion. AM World was not a contingency plan. AM World was an active operation. We met with and interviewed people who were involved in it, who were inside it. If there was such a plan, why did none of Kennedy's top advisors, including Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, know anything about it? They believe that even someone as high in the government as the Secretary of Defense didn't know about this very imminent uh, U.S. invasion plan. I think that's preposterous. Perhaps it wasn't a question of who would be told about the plan, but when. There is a memo in which it appears that a meeting was going to be called involving people like McNamara and Secretary of State Rusk, who had not been told that all this planning was for a real coup plan. Uh, that meeting was to be held uh, three days after JFK went to Dallas. But if all that's true, could the mob really have pulled off the ultimate hit? The mafia wasn't capable of the kind of political calculations that are being imputed to them in the book. The Mafia figures come off like Washington insiders, believing they can cover up their involvement in the assassination. Since an investigation could expose the Kennedy's Cuban coup plan and ignite nuclear war. Their view of the Mafia is some awesome hybrid between Tony Soprano and Henry Kissinger. 
But the mob's vast empire and connections to the political world are testament to their power. These guys were running business empires that rivaled General Motors. I mean, they were not hicks from Sicily. And then there's this. If Kennedy did have a plan to topple Castro, the mobsters would never want to stop it. They'd welcome it. Havana was a huge source of income for the mafia. They were desperate to get back there. Why on earth would the mob uh, kill President Kennedy on the eve of the U.S. government's plot to get rid of Castro? That just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense if Havana was the mafia's only gold mine. But it wasn't. Cuba was small potatoes. They were, they were doing very well in other places. They were building an empire in the Bahamas. They had infiltrated Las Vegas. You know, Cuba was a fly on the back of an elephant for them. Finally, there's the portrait of Lee Harvey Oswald as the mafia's fall guy. Lee Harvey Oswald wasn't the mob's boy. He beat them to Kennedy. They would have pinned a medal on him, but he just wasn't doing it for them. Lamar Waldron insists the evidence shows Oswald was tied to mobster Carlos Marcello. Congressional investigators in the late 1970s found half a dozen uh, people who said that Lee Harvey Oswald was working with Carlos Marcello's pilot and Carlos Marcello's private detective in the summer of 1963. The key to unlocking the mystery of the assassination and the Mafia's involvement lies with the man at the center of it all, Lee Harvey Oswald. One fifty p.m., November 22, 1963. A pale, skinny 24-year-old is arrested at a Dallas movie theater. I like some legal representation. He'll soon explode into history books as the man who killed JFK. But is Lee Harvey Oswald really the Mafia's patsy in its plot to kill the president? I'm just a patsy. Military intelligence concluded that Oswald was incapable of doing the actual shooting or of masterminding the assassination. He was essentially what he said that night at the police station, that he was just a patsy. But the Mafia assassination theory may have a serious flaw. There is no hard evidence that Oswald ever worked for the mob, or for the CIA, or Fidel Castro either, as other researchers have claimed. That's why author Gerald Posner believes Oswald acted alone. He was an angry and obsessed young man who had the motive, means, and opportunity to kill John F. Kennedy. The 24-year-old sociopath, a loser in life, Lee Harvey Oswald, with a gun and a scope worth a little over $20, was able to fire three shots and kill the President of the United States. A poor kid from a broken home, Oswald is an outsider from day one. He dreams of becoming a spy. He joins the Marines, only to be teased relentlessly. By age 20, Oswald is fed up with his country. He's going to defect to the Soviet Union, the arch enemy of the United States in 1959. And he does it. And he goes over to the Soviet Union and he announces, here I am. And the Soviets interview him. And they think he's a little wacky. Puzzled by Oswald, but seeing a possible asset, the Soviets set him up with a job and an apartment in Minsk. He marries a Russian woman. And the KGB keeps a watchful eye. They listened to his conversations. They had his room bugged inside of Minsk. And they thought Oswald was pretty far out there. If Oswald aspires to join the KGB, it never happens. KGB records disclosed years later show that Oswald is simply monitored by the agency. Disappointed by the Soviet Union, Oswald heads back to the United States with his family in 1961. He changed his mind. He essentially begged that he changed his mind. I really didn't give up any secrets. And please let me come home. And they did. But his Russian adventure does not go unnoticed by the FBI. They were concerned that after this spell in Russia that the Russians might try to contact him in the U.S. So they wanted to keep tabs on him. Unemployed, marriage on the rocks, feeling unappreciated by not one but two countries. Oswald is nearing the breaking point. He buys a mail-order rifle and pistol. Oswald's wife, Marina, uh, remembers taking those pictures. And they were shot in uh, their backyard in March of 63. Oswald was proud of his weapons. This was not a man who was afraid to take a shot at somebody. The president is not Oswald's first assassination attempt. 
seven months before Dallas, Oswald stalks General Edwin Walker, a right-wing Texas politician. He takes a shot at the general on April 10th as Walker sits by a window at home. Oswald grazes Walker's arm. The shooting is a mystery for Dallas police, one they won't unravel until after the JFK assassination. They had a mangled bullet that had gone through the wall and into the next room. It turns out it was Oswald. For Oswald, it's yet another failure. In the summer of 1963, growing angrier and more frustrated, Oswald provokes a confrontation with a bunch of CIA-sponsored anti-Castro Cubans. He's arrested and speaks to reporters. Are you a Marxist? I would very definitely say that I, uh, I uh, am a Marxist. That is correct. But that, that does not mean, however, that I'm a, a uh, communist. Could Oswald's public pro-Castro activity seal his fate as the mob's perfect fall guy? It certainly puts him in the limelight he craves and on the CIA's radar. It was never particularly credible that when the CIA said, oh, this guy was just routine and we didn't know anything about him. Now we know that they were watching him carefully. But did it go farther than just monitoring? Was Oswald working for the CIA? There's absolutely not a shred of evidence that Oswald was working for the CIA. In September, Oswald tries to emigrate to Cuba, but the Cubans won't let him in. He's crushed. That's the final blow for him. He is in an angry mood. In October and November of 1963, the frustration level for Lee Harvey Oswald is at the breaking point. His new job at the Texas School Book Depository provides an unexpected benefit for a frustrated gunman with assassination on his mind. On November 22nd, 1963, 12.30 p.m., he's at the right place at the right time for the perfect shot. Oswald, great shot? No, but good enough on that day? Yes, three shots, only one of which does the trick. I work in that building. When he's arrested by Dallas police, he offers only a few tantalizing comments. Come on, the president. No, they're taking me in because of the fact that I live in the Soviet Union. Unlike any other assassin in American history, Lee Harvey Oswald did not take credit proudly for this crime. Then, two days later, in a split second, he's silenced forever by mafia associate Jack shot. Ruby. He's been shot. It was that murder of Oswald, the fact that there was no trial that took away the possibility for this case ever really to be settled. Oswald takes his secrets to the grave, never admitting a connection to the CIA, the mob, or anyone else. But there are still many secrets left to be revealed, buried in the government's own files. It can often be hard for the public and even officials to sort out the real from the unreal when it comes to the JFK assassination and all the different conspiracy theories. Lamar Waldron and Tom Hartman hope that what makes their version of events the definitive one is not just the theory they put forward, it's what's behind it. Their 17 years of research through thousands of documents. What we saw, the willingness to participate in releasing records with regard to the Kennedy assassination that was part of a larger um, notion that government should be open. Yet the government may not have released those documents for another 20 years if it weren't for a powerful lobbying force, Hollywood. I do hope the film stirs up uh, some uh, new thought and some, uh, provides some new insight. In 1991, Filmmaker Oliver Stone's conspiracy drama, JFK, caused an uproar with a public already suspicious of the government's version of the assassination and brought the resurgence of other theories, such as a plot by the mafia to kill the president. What Oliver Stone portrayed to the American public through his film, while maybe not 100% ground truth, is much closer to the truth than the fairy tales we've been getting from the government. The cry from the American people was loud and clear open the files, as Stone himself even testified on Capitol Hill. The Stone Wall must come down. As a result of Stone's film, Congress passed the Assassination Records Collection Act of 1992. A panel was convened to evaluate thousands of files and declassify them. You have to say this, if it weren't for the film, we wouldn't have six million pieces of paper that we have today. So whatever view of the movie is, he did us a, a service. 
despite the wealth of new documents available in the last decade. Only a handful of researchers have dived in. It's not good enough to say that it's the land of kooks and conspiracy freaks and we're not going to go there. You should go there because most of the American people, a decisive majority, continues to believe there was a conspiracy behind the death of their president. Still, some investigators doubt the JFK mystery will ever be solved. There are many researchers who cling to the hope that at some point we'll pry a document out of government archives that will pretty well lay it all out and will settle the matter, you know, for once and for all, but uh, I'm not one of them. A million more pages of documents still lie buried away in government vaults, and they won't see the light of day for another decade, if ever. Within those pages, perhaps the evidence that will prove or disprove the mob hit scenario. A theory fueled by the deaths of prominent mafia figures who died before they had a chance to reveal what they might know. Johnny Rosselli, after being subpoenaed to uh, testify before the House Select Committee on Assassinations, uh, his chopped up body was discovered in an oil drum in Biscayne Bay. And you have Ruby dying of cancer in his jail cell in Dallas saying, bring this Chief Justice down here, I've got to talk to him, I've got to tell him something that he needs to know. Without that testimony, the government's remaining secret files become even more crucial. A government official admitted that over one million CIA files related to the assassination are still secret, presumably until 2017 when all the documents are finally supposed to be released. Washington Post online reporter Jefferson Morley is suing the CIA to get its documents on Lee Harvey Oswald, documents that for years the agency denied even having. Those records exist, the CIA has them, and they're fighting in federal court today, 42 years after the fact, saying, we don't need to share everything we know about the Kennedy assassination. Who knows what bombshells may be in those still hidden files? If we uh, are to know the full story about what happened to John F. Kennedy in Dallas, we need to have all those documents. The government may hold all remaining assassination documents until 2017. But JFK researchers are pressuring for their release now. In the book, we call for a truth commission, you know, just say, you know, let's get this stuff out. You know, let's just lay it out and, and look at it. In our mind, a good starting point is let's just open the doors on this stuff. With those doors open, researchers and historians may finally solve the mystery of that dark November day in 1963. After examining everything from the site of the shooting to the gun itself, the Warren Commission, charged with investigating the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, finds that he was brutally gunned down by Lee Harvey Oswald, a disgruntled ex-Marine with Soviet ties and Cuban sympathies. He acted alone. Today, most libraries have dumped their uh, volumes of the Warren Commission, and for most people, they realize it needs to go on the fiction shelf. Now, authors Lamar Waldron and Tom Hartman lay out in their book, Ultimate Sacrifice, what they believe is the real story behind the Kennedy assassination. It's a new twist on an old theory. The Mafia did it. But the authors insist it was the mob's knowledge of a secret plan by the whispers of a mafia hit on the president begin to circulate almost immediately. The mob's hatred of the Kennedy family is no secret. Well, uh, they, we have uh, organized crime and some uh, big gangsters and hoodlums. The strongest motive for murder is self-defense. And in the case of the mafia, I'm sure they viewed this as self-defense. After JFK was buried, Bobby was literally a shattered man, a shell of what he had been. All the Mafia prosecutions were scaled back. It's a dangerous game Bobby's been playing, going after powerful gangsters while his family has its own tangled relationship with them. From his father's bootlegging days to JFK's relationship with a godfather's girlfriend. But it's another connection to the mob that would bring down the president. There was a deal to use the 
One bullet. One gunman. One official conclusion that 75% of Americans say they don't believe. The idea that a, a person could take this piece of junk and hit a moving target is ludicrous. Was Oswald a solitary assassin or a well-played patsy? I positively know nothing about this situation here. New evidence of not just one assassination attempt, but three. The Kennedy assassination remains, over four decades later, one of the great untold stories. Tantalizing clues about a mafia hit, a government cover-up. We have smoking gun documents from the CIA. And a presidential scheme that allowed it to happen. Kennedy's to overthrow Castro that gave the mafia the perfect cover. They were able to assassinate JFK in a way that forced Bobby Kennedy and other key government officials to cover up much crucial information to protect that top secret coup plan. It's a theory that's captured the attention of other JFK assassination researchers. Though they don't all agree with the conclusion, they recognize it's a well-researched scenario. Waldron and Hartman have spent two decades pouring through thousands of government documents and interviewing key players with revelations to tell. This is their proof. November 22nd, 1963. President Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time, which is about 35 minutes ago. As a country reels in shock and disbelief, a thousand miles away from Dallas, at a restaurant in Tampa, a celebration is underway. Mobster Santo Traficante raises his glass and toasts the assassination of John F. Kennedy. For Mafia Don Carlos Marcello in New Orleans, and for Johnny Rosselli in Chicago, it is also welcome news. The president's death marks the end of Bobby Kennedy's crusade against them, a relentless campaign that resulted in 12 times more cases brought against organized crime than ever before. As Carlos Marcello explained it, if you cut off the tail of the dog, kill Bobby Kennedy, the head of the dog, JFK, will turn around and bite you. However, if you cut off the head of the dog, you kill JFK, the tail of the dog stops wagging on its own.